Good evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Kevin C. O'Leary discussing his book, Madison's Sorrow. Uh, we are so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this uncertain time. Uh, Romans Live will continue to host virtual events, and you can learn more about them on our website, as well as um, our social media. Our next event is uh, this Friday, May 22nd at 6 p.m. with author Edward Farmer as he discusses his novel, Pale. Uh, you can register for that uh, here on Crowdcast. Uh, for regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. Now, this evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. We might be able to sprinkle it in through the course of the event as well. So if you'd like to submit a question, go ahead and use the uh, Ask a Question button, which is right down over here at the bottom of the screen. Um, that way you can enter it there. It'll, it's an easy way for us to for us to know that um, it's something that wants to be asked. And if there's a question you like that you see there, uh, you can always uh, upvote it and uh, it'll be uh, head towards the top of our list. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as uh, we'll allow. So um, also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's featured book, you can click on the uh, green button directly below the viewer screen. It says, Buy Madison Sorrow. That will take you uh, to our Romans website where you can continue the checkout process. Um, and uh, we are now open for curbside service. So if you live in the area, you would be going and be able to pick it up uh, once it is in. Um, with that being said, let me introduce our author for this evening. Kevin C. O'Leary is a research fellow at the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of California, Irvine. A contributor to the American Prospect, he was the lead West Coast reporter for Time, as well as a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. And he was a former editorial editor at our own Pasadena Star News, here in Pasadena. He earned his PhD at Yale University. His previous book, Saving Democracy, A Plan for a Real Representation in America, was a finalist for the American Political Science Association's Michael Harrington Award. He is here today to uh, discuss his new book, Madison's Sorrow, Today's War on the Founders and America's, America's Liberal Idea. So without further ado, Kevin. Ah, thank you so much, Gilbert. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and to uh, thanks for everybody else who's tuned in to our new Zoom world. Um, and so, it should be feel free to ask questions as we go along or at the end. Um, so, I've been working on this book before Donald Trump emerged, and it turned out that Mr. Trump fit with what I was talking about, and I had, I, I dove into. Um, in a way, the book's an ode to liberalism in the age of Trump, in the age of this dark time. Um, now, I, I, as a journalist, I'm used to being a reporter and reporting on the news just straight up. Uh, and I did that for Time, and I did that for the LA Times and different places, and I've written pieces straight up with the American Prospect. But when I looked at what was going on in American politics, um, I, I was like a lot of people trying to figure out why the Republican Party continued to march right. And that's what I've tried to figure out. And I think I have. Um, and so that's what the book's about. I, a lot of other writers, very distinguished writers, had gone back to the 1960s and saw things happening then. I decided to go back further in time um, to try to tell the story. And so that's what's different about this book. It's, it's a it's a it's a, it's a history of America with a particular perspective. And I trace two threads. Um, it's kind of like our intellectual DNA in our heads. It's not party politics, but there's a liberal side to our consciousness that's always been talked about. Um, that's been the dominant force because of Jefferson and the founders and so forth. Um, but there's also this illiberal strain that rises up. It's always been there. And I wanted to figure that other side out that, that crops up occasionally. Um, and so what I've done is trace that across history 
and to my kind of amazement, um, I've come to the conclusion at the end of the book that we're actually in a reactionary revolution by the new GOP that's rejected conservatism and is now reactionary or liberal, as it's called, and that they are protesting not only the New Deal state, which you know the, the radical right has done that for a long time, but they're actually protesting and trying to change the country away from the founders' ideals. And that's pretty serious stuff. And that's what this election's about. And that's where the time we're in. And, and, and we need to recognize why that happened and, and, and the pieces that go into that puzzle. That's, that's, that's it's it's to the book. Yeah, it's a fascinating, a fascinating read, and um, something I think that, like you said, had been kind of attempted, or you know, people have different viewpoints on on certain you know inflection points and where uh, things kind of took a different uh, road uh, for the country. Um, now, you you mm -hmm. in the intro to the book you kind of start us, before you go back and, and lay the foundation um, uh, quite engagingly and succinctly, uh, you you start at this kind of moment, um, this rooftop moment uh, in the 60s. And yes. uh, it's 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 something that kind of, you, you, you compare it to a, an electrical spark uh, that kind of gets things going, even if it wasn't, uh, the, the purpose of the meeting wasn't necessarily a success per se, but it did lay a groundwork and kind of spark something. No, no can we right. can so paint so that let me picture? Jump in and describe. So, so, so it was a Life magazine picture from the 1964 Republican National Convention. And it turned out we tracked down the photographer that took it and we got the actual negative. So it comes oh, out wow. very clear. It's the first picture of the book. My publisher was great, Pegasus. They let us let me do 16 pages of pictures. A lot of them are colored. And those pictures, if you wanted a quick read, that you just look at the pictures and the and the, I give kind of a little bit of detail in the captions about what this is about. That first picture is the moment when this reactionary America comes together. And the thesis of the book is this: that there's two illiberal threads in American politics. There's always been racism. We we know that. You know, you go through grammar school, high school. Okay, there was. Reconstruction and there was slavery and the civil rights movement. And then it's like, it's over. We've had Obama. Wait a second. Oh, no, we're not past racism. It's like, it's pretty strong stuff. So we know about that. The other side of it is the plutocrats that first came to power in a sense of domination of the economy in the late uh, 19th century. So the 1890s. And they thought liberty should be for just them. You know, if you could get rich as, as Rockefeller, you should have the liberty he has to do whatever, whatever he wants. He was buying state legislatures. He was doing all kinds of stuff. And the other Robert Barons were the same way. Well, Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt fought back against that. Lincoln fought back against the slave owners, the slaveholders. Um, and what happened was that the two sides, the bad parts of our political consciousness, were kept in separate houses, so to speak. So, so the Southern Democrats were Southern Democrats with a D. They hated Lincoln, so they weren't going to be Republicans. So the segregated South was on the Democratic side. The capitalists, the hard right capitalists were part of the Republican Party, which was a broad based tent until 1960. They had Teddy Roosevelt progressives, they had moderates, they had conservatives, and they had some people that hated the New Deal state. What happens in this meeting was when, 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 uh, and the day before the convention happens, George Wallace sends a delegate to see Barry Goldwater and propose something audacious. And Mr. Martin comes and meets secretly with Barry Goldwater. It's on a rooftop and suppose the cover story was they were talking about ham radios because Goldwater liked ham radios. The real purpose of the meeting was for Wallace to convey through this guy, Mr. Martin, that he wanted to be Goldwater's vice presidential running mate. And Wallace could see the future. He could see what, what Trump was able to accomplish. He says, we'll get all the South 
and we'll go up and we'll take some of the states in the industrial Midwest and we could win. Well, Barry Goldwater wasn't quite there. <laughs> he thought Wallace was a racist thug. He, Wallace, uh, Goldwater ends up winning in the deep South. He takes five states, but Lyndon Johnson cleans his clock. But that's the start of the conservative, so-called conservative quote movement that a lot of people joined as young people and so forth. And the energy behind the conservative movement was the two sides, the, the capitalist class inside the Republican Party being joined by white Southerners over time. And gradually, here's the key, they drove out moderates and pushed the party to the right, to the right, to the right. And so John McCain's dead and gone. Um, the other senator from Arizona, Flake, is has been forced to retire. Most of the people who are, you know, normal conservatives who like who like government. The thing about conservatives in American political history is people who are conservative don't hate government, but these new people in, in the GOP hate government. And so it's quite different. And that's the story I'm telling it. And those wires cross, and that's the beginning of where we are now, right? But I also trace back how we got to the point of that rooftop meeting. Right. And, and I think that's an important uh, part of it is that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people see, uh, you know, th that time um, when that meeting took place, the Goldwater uh, Republicans and, and leading into the, the Southern strategy as the kind of moment that things changed. Um, right. But you obviously take it back much further than that to the foundations and not only just like not only the foundations of the, of the family fathers, but what where they're kind of mindset and, and thoughts uh, kind of originated in or, or kind of schools that they followed essentially right. and, and the right. thinkers and, and right. philosophers who, who, who formed uh, and, what and, would become. And, and, one in, and one in particular, but before we go there, I'll say something about, we always hear if you're political, you've heard about the Southern strategy that both Nixon right. and Reagan pursued, but the South had already started on that strategy. They were 20 years ahead. This guy, there's a guy named Collins who went to University of Chicago and Harvard. He had all these degrees. He's from a plantation farm, plantation family in, in Alabama, I think. And he's completely a segregationist and he's trying to figure out how to save segregation. He's, he's, the, he's the idea guy behind Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats in the late uh -huh. 1940s. He's already writing a book saying, we've got to go get the right wing of, 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 the, of, the, of the Republican party. If we do that and we lighten up on racism, vocally right if we make it more implicit and quiet we can make this thing about kind of constitutional issues and states rights and government and not be quite as racist and we can have a national coalition that, that protects us with what we want to do in the south okay just to spin back in time the founding fathers didn't just show up in philadelphia in 1776 and then 17 87 with you know they came with a lot of intellectual baggage that was good baggage they were they were learned people of the enlightenment um and jefferson and madison and hamilton and all those folks they were deeply influenced by a number of thinkers but one in particular um that's been spoken of a lot in american history his name's john locke so a lot of people have said americans liberalism goes back to john locke and he's famous for talking about private property and government by consent and, and a lot of things. But in recent years, scholars, and I join in this group, have come to see that a focus on his later book, which was his political philosophy called A Second Treatise, is too narrow. You don't really understand Locke if you just look at The Second Treatise, which is super famous for a good reason. You need to look at his corpus as a whole, and especially his book of philosophy, which is a great book was a bestseller for two centuries because it's very lucid and kind of easy to read, called an, uh, an Essay on Human Understanding. And in that book, a hundred years, 18, what is this, is 1690s, 1690s is published. It's a hundred years before the French Revolution. It sets up the French Revolution <laughs> because in his book, he says, guess what? When we think about how people think, peasants think just the same as kings. Kings and the aristocrats are no better. They see the world with their brains the same way everybody does. And therefore, when you, when you take that, internalize it, it becomes a really radical notion like, okay, ordinary people can think for themselves. It's kind of part of the Protestant Reformation. 
Um, and and humans have judgment. I mean, this philosophy is really interesting. It's, it still makes a lot of sense today. It, 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 there's been a lot of philosophers since, but he's not been bypassed in, 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 in how he thinks about things. He's still an important, you know, philosopher who got a lot of things right. And when I look at that, and, and I look at what Jefferson and Madison and Washington and the rest of the founders did, they were founding a new world, right? We know the new world. Well, we were rejecting the old world and Locke's living in England a couple decades before, right? Several decades, you know, generation, a generation two before. And Locke says, you know, and his radical, when he gets more radical as he gets older, he rejects feudalism and he kind of invents America with his philosophy. He basically rejects the old world and the principles of the old world were important. They were privilege, hierarchy, inequality, and exclusion. Those four things defined a feudal aristocratic society. That's the, the pillars it's built on, right? You will build a caste and class system based on those four principles. The Americans said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna have a middle-class society. You know, and California is an epitome of that. Cosmopolitan, middle-class, it's gonna be about liberty, equality, and democracy. We're gonna be different. So that's the founding fathers. And Jefferson buys into that. The Declaration's all about that. James Madison makes sure that the word slavery doesn't get into the Constitution or property of man. They're dedicated. They're, they're, you know, they can't get everything done, but they do a lot. And that's the start of American liberalism. And there's a line that goes straight from the founding fathers and Locke to Obama and the current political group, right? Elizabeth Warren, uh, Joe Biden, but especially between those guys to, to Obama, you know, our, our last Democratic president. There's a, there's a straight line. There's no break. And uh, there's a, another philosopher who comes into play um, that, speaking of the revolution, who, who writes something that's kind of uh, an answer against that that conservatives have used, and that's Edmund Burke. Um, and right, and so Burke's interesting, and I end up being a fan of Burke. Okay, so um, Burke was an opponent of the French Revolution, but he supported pretty much supported the American Revolution and, and hmm. said to King George, "Why are you doing this? There are they're part of us. Why are you getting so crazy?" But he hated the French Revolution because it was a total revolution that tried to change everything at once. So Burke is the father of conservatism, but conservatism's, you know, in the American case, they're with liberals in the sense of they want to found a new world. That's if you're an American conservative, you don't want to have caste and class and privilege and those things. You want to have a middle class society. You are like Lincoln. You're like Dwight Eisenhower. You're like those people. That's the tradition of American conservatism, and it's very positive about government. Government's a tool that you need. You can't run a society just on a market system. You can't do just on, on private enterprise. It's going to run into trouble. You have to have both politics and markets. Um, and uh, and uh, and Burke is someone who is kind of viewed as as the father of conservatism, and but it all works together and i think for some i mean for someone like me uh who i i know history to a degree but like to the idea that it's like oh yeah he's he's the father of conservatism but there's things that he's reasonable about sounds kind of like i i'm not as familiar with that version <laughs> uh yeah, it, he's got a, he's got a lot of wisdom and what he, he's he's dedicated to protecting the monarchy and the crown but in his famous books most famous book, The Reflections on the Revolution of France, there's a lot of wisdom in that book. He's, right. he's, he's, he's smart. I mean, you can be critical of him protecting the, the, the monarchy and, and the old ways, as both Mary Wollstonecraft and Thomas Paine were, but you can still respect um, Burke for, for what he was attempting to do. Um, and so they, as the as these people influence the founding fathers and the fathers, the, the, the people that you talk about, obviously Jefferson and, uh, and Madison, but you also talk about Thomas Paine as well. Right. And so I, I, I kind of put Paine, you know, isn't typically seen as one of the founders, but right. he should be seen. He's not at the constitutional convention. He's not a signer of the declaration, but it's his pamphlet, his brilliant, you know, um, 
kind of just stating the truth better than anybody else, that, that monarchy is a sham. And why do we want to have a monarchy in common sense? 1776. Um, that helps really helps spark the American Revolution. Um, and then 20 years later, during the French Revolution, he writes Rights of Man. Um, and in both books, he's, he's articulating, you know, a liberal society that's going to have capitalism, but it's going to have political rights, and we're not going to accept an aristocratic situation. We're not going to accept monarchy. We're going we're gonna to make a democracy, this new invention of representative government work in the way that Europeans are profoundly skeptical. And Jefferson, one of the historians of Jefferson, says he was very close to pain in his thinking. Um, Jefferson was cautious because he's a politician, so he's not going to put everything in print. But it, you know, the, the big difference was Jefferson was caught up in racism. He could never get past his race, racist understanding, and he wanted to get rid of slavery. And when he did, not always, he wanted to send the black slaves to the West or back to Africa. Um, but also Jefferson's interesting as one of the founders because he's most radical when he's young. And when he's writing the declaration, he's got a paragraph in the original draft where he wants to blame slavery on King George. And if that had stayed in the declaration, we would have been on record against slavery from the beginning. Unfortunately, it got X'd out. But, but that kind of shows where he's coming from. And, and Payne is very much in the same camp as Jefferson. And I mean, that's Jefferson being someone who is looking for these ideals and along with other some of the other founding fathers to look to these ideals that we were trying to set this country up for while at the same time the complexity of them not being able to uh, someone like jefferson not being able to divorce himself from his the racist views that he also held is something that kind of continues you know yes. and and yeah. and because as as we well know he had a civil war about it um and and that but there's characters that are like that as we as a, as a country kind of were building ourselves that were kind of had that complex yeah. take of wanting this idealistic society while at the same time having these you know in some cases virulent virulent racist ideals about things that, yeah, that put I, us at opposition with each other right i think you're referring one one person that fits that like jefferson he is is this amalgamation of ideas in their heads Jefferson's got both the good and bad. Well, Tom Watson, who is a leader of the populist revolt, he's this Georgian who decides as a white guy, we should be allies with the poor black farmers. And our real problem is the rich guys up there above. And he leads the populist revolt in the South. Now, unfortunately, the populists end up losing out. And after they do, then <laughs> Watson becomes a virulent racist. And he continues in politics. So he kind of has this tragic, you know, combination of things in his head, um, which is too bad. Yeah. And they and the Civil War being one of the obviously huge revolutionary that you talk about, like the, the, the revolutions that happen here in America and that and and the yeah. Civil War being part of that and not only what it did you know to people against each other within the country but also the things that followed it and the right. decisions that were made or decisions that were made um in right in the reconstruction area following it that, that yeah the reconstruction's mm -hmm. key because you know lincoln's our great president because he goes to war over this and he defeats the southerners who want to expand slavery across the country and that would have changed this into a you know like a plantation country like Latin America and democracy would have gone away. Um, but he succeeds and the abolitionists succeed. The tragedy was that 750,000 Americans lose their lives in this terrible civil war. And then at the end, we do reconstruction, but we don't do it right. And there was this guy, Thaddeus Stevens, and he's played and he's a, he's a character in that famous Lincoln movie that won the Academy Award. Thaddeus Stevens is a Pennsylvania congressman. He's really smart and he sees the future he doesn't want to take the, the leaders of the Confederacy and execute them, string them up or shoot them. No, he wants to take the property of the biggest plantations and divide that land up between the poor whites and the poor blacks. It's the famous 40 acres and a mule idea. 
And he talks and does speeches all over the country for a couple of years trying to get this done. But at the end of the war, people are exhausted and they, they're just kind of like moving on and, and, you know, it just doesn't happen. And that's, that's like the biggest tragedy in American politics, in my view, because if you go from 1865 to 1965, the South is a one party because it's only the Southern Democrats running it. There's no Republicans, a one party dictatorship. And it's authoritarian. So my take on this is it's not just the racism in the South. It's an authoritarian mode of mind of the people in charge, that they're used to being in charge. They expect to be in charge. And when people, political scientists, went back and looked at how politics worked in those states, they found it was a small clique in every state. It, was, it wasn't mm -hmm. democratic. It was just kind of, you know, elections were rigged when, when they when they eliminated blacks from the rolls in the start of the 20th century, they also eliminated lots of poor whites from the rolls. And that was the real target. So it turns out the racism that the poor, it's called black belt whites. That was because of the soil in Mississippi and Alabama was really rich. And they had the political problem, like in the revolution in Haiti, they were always afraid there was going to be a black revolt and they were going to get killed. They knew their political problem was we're a minority. We're a white faces in a sea of blacks. We have to have an alliance with so-called the hill country whites where there weren't many blacks, like in upstate Alabama. And they had to figure out how do we do that? How do we make them come with us? And they did it by saying, and this goes back to the origins of slavery, to treat whites as if, wow, if you're a white person, you're part of the ruling class, even though you're the poorest guy at the, at the sawmill, you can still kick, you know, kick black guy or yell at him when you're walking home. Right. And so they, they just, they developed that and they're skilled at it. And that was Southern politics for a long time. It just, it was, you know, there was no and, public sector and it was, it was awful. And it was dur during that time that you speak of the, that that's like that hundred years that 1865 to 1965 of, of just uh, authoritarian you know yeah. racist regime going on there it's right. something that's that was they fought the civil war for it and then they still were able to figure out a way to keep it and right so and, they, they keep power for themselves where they live they just don't they're, they're stopped from expanding it right right stop them right from taking over the west and taking over the country. But we basically say, okay, go, because they had that funny 1877 election where they kind of had to concede and, and, you know, Hayes, whatever the presidents were, and then basically said, okay, you guys get to run your own thing. And that set in place a regional attitude towards slavery in the South. It's kind of like slavery is a regional issue. It was only when President Kennedy made a great speech in 1963 where he said, no, no, this is a national moral issue for the country. And he put it back on the national burner. And of course, you know, you had the whole civil rights movement and Martin Luther King and everything going on. And they succeed because Johnson does the right thing as president and does the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and changes American politics. But part of the reason why that, you, 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 he, Johnson does make the right choice there. Uh, and, and before it, you lead into later in the sixties and the whole like part that everybody seems to think is the Southern strategy that changes everything. But we're talking about a hundred years of where they continued it. So it's really in great and people weren't going to just because uh, this yes. something was voted on uh, and, and, or something was written into law, right, it wasn't right. going to automatically change this mentality no, no, that no, was, and, and that you, was and, ingrained and part of right. how they lived. And you read about Jerry Falwell, right? So here's something I do in the book. I decided, I had to make choices. Any writer does in fiction or nonfiction. You got to make choices. What goes in, what stays out. And a lot of people have written about evangelicals and the right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just decided too much of that is just kind of like a politically correct cover because the reality, the Southern Baptists, a lot of the Southern evangelicals, that was a homestead for white families and they set up white schools. This is what Falwell did. Falwell was outright crazy racist in the 60s before he founded the moral majority he founds a christian school so a lot of people in the south just abandon the public schools and move their kids over and gradually they start voting republican and you end up with politics such that 
for a while, and I wrote a really nice, I'm still very proud of it, and Bob Kuttner helped me, the editor of the American Prospect. We did a story together about Trump and the, and the, 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 the racial politics of the South mm-hmm. exactly four years ago, right before the Republican convention. And part of that article was about how there had been reconstruction had failed, right? And now the second reconstruction, meaning starting with Johnson, was succeeding. It seemed to be. And part of the success was you could see people like Bill Clinton and um, Jimmy Carter and even a guy that was a defense secretary, I think it's Mavis, winning governorships in places that they can't now. And they won because there was a biracial coalition of whites and blacks. And then gradually the whites peeled off and, and moderate Democrats got beat and the Tea Party comes along and pushes out anybody who's a reasonable conservative Republican, puts in more radicals. And so now it's back to kind of like the white politics of the past. And if you, according to Reverend Barber, who I interviewed for that piece, mm. right, the, the famous civil rights yeah. leader who lives in, in, uh, South Car- in North Carolina, um, if you, the Republicans understand, if you have a lock on the South, that's 11 states. If you get all those electoral delegates and those Senate seats and those House seats, you don't have to get that many, many, many more across the country. There's a lot of people in the South. There's, it's, 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 it's electorally rich. Right. And so they've taken it back. So that's why it's important. We win, the Democrats are able to win Virginia now and maybe Florida and Georgia may be in play because of state Stacey Abrams. But that's what happened. It's like politics, you know, starts to change after the Civil Rights Act in a bad way. And, and all that time in, before leading up to that, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the poor whites in the South who are, you know, trying to hold on to whatever power they can kind of create or that they've created. Right. And, um, but there's also this other side that is not part of them uh, during this time at all which are in the north which are like the capitalist elites who uh are traditionally at this time democrats i mean i mean uh yeah who are the republicans republicans i'm sorry who yeah who are trying to do you know the robber barons leading up to whatever they can do to to wield their market power right Right. they're totally offended at Buckley's family, they they hated the New Deal, right? So so that is you're right. That's separate. So just a final thing on on the, on the racial side, the poor whites they get what's called by W. E. B. Du Bois a, a psychic wage. Their psychic wage, and I referred to this before, is just because they're white, right? Even though mm-hmm. you don't get paid very much, you have this wage. You're never because you're white in this country. The white privilege is even if you become a street from that point of view because you're white okay mm-hmm. switching there's this whole other universe in the north of of um people on the right who hate the new deal and there's been good books written about this from the start of the new deal on just kind of secretly not secretly just like plotting like how can we get power we've got to push this back and it there's all these intellectuals and so forth building up to reagan's election
I think we might have lost Kevin if uh, I had a big freeze there for a second. I can't tell if anybody else can. You can see that, so bear with us. So uh, let's give it just a moment here. Sorry about this, folks. Uh, we are reliant on uh, technology um, and um, people's uh, Wi-Fi connections. Uh, so um, give us just one moment and looks like he should be coming back on. This is always the fun part about uh, the live part of Romans Live. Uh, let's see here. Um, Give me one second, everybody, as I was, I was in the middle of being really engrossed in what he was saying. Uh, and uh, I hope, okay. Um, don't forget, uh, you can uh, ask a question down there at the bottom uh, where uh, we can interject those into um, our discussion, um, or we can just kind of go for them uh right at the right at the end um so uh you can also don't forget to uh buy madison's sorrow uh which uh is that button also there um let's see give me one second uh it looks like he still might be having a moment um and looks like um, we had someone there in the comments. Thanks, Lita. And Kevin is trying to reconnect. Uh, so hopefully that will happen. Um, and uh, we're of course going to get. We're making our way through um, this, uh, through a lot of the, the the major points of this book, um, and we have not quite gotten into um, even the most recent times. So um, it'll it'll tie in together once we see that. Um, and I appreciate everybody's patience as we wait through this uh looks like he might still be having a little bit of trouble reconnecting uh, he is coming he is on his way as we're getting word here in the comments you can see that there for everybody <laughs> uh so it's uh, it's a little bit of uh drama for the the middle of the event um, you can Things like this don't necessarily happen um, when we're in store. And uh, so this is part of our uh, new version of doing things. Uh, it does come with some other uh, occasional issues. Uh, so it looks like uh, he is back and connected. So we are going to give him a second to uh, reconnect here to the talk. Should be coming up. In just a moment, he is present uh, and looking for uh, looking for that moment to come back on. And it looks like okay. we have got him. <laughs> okay, sorry about the disappearance. It's like <laughs> um, it's like it, it, was, it was in a break, right? So we're switching I mean, now. I did. I did. I did tell everybody. I was like, we kind of had hit the one point. We were just getting to the other side of it that was going right. to lead us into the right. current times. Right. So, right. Uh, so, so, so I'll just jump in fast. Um, so the other side of the bad consciousness in our head goes. Most of us heard of the word libertarian, and usually we think of that as well. Okay, you know, minimize legal requirements. If you want to smoke dope, fine. If you don't want to wear a helmet when you're doing your my motorcycle, just kind of leave us alone. Let me do my own thing. But libertarianism is a more serious thing than that in terms of kind of hard right economics. And it starts with a guy named Herbert Spencer, who is a social Darwinist before Darwin. He writes his famous book, Social Statics. Who knows why it's called that? in 1850. 
Um, and it's so famous that, that um, one of the Oliver Wendell Holmes has to write a dissent in a famous Supreme Court case saying social status shouldn't determine, determine what the court does. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? Because <laughs> that book's so famous. And Carnegie loved it. And a lot of people liked it. Well, he had a dark view of, in a way, he had a weird view. He thought that evolution could happen within a generation. And he thought the gene pool of the poor, that if you were poor, that meant that you weren't worthy. It was kind of a Calvinist kind of continuation, right? Mm -hmm. If you were successful as a capitalist, right? If you'd made it, therefore, you were part of the moral better class. And he had this, this kind of wild view that as generations went on, if we let the poor people die off, right? then the gene pool will get better and better and progressively we won't need government literally he was saying people should wow. die wow. i mean he's literally like that he's he's saying oh I, I know it sounds terrible but this is the providence of god right he's saying it's 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 the way evolution is working and we're going to have this wonderful country where we won't need government because everybody will be a morally upstanding citizen the only reason we have government is because we have the riffraff at the bottom well, you can see how that fits with slavery, right? If, if you're looking at the yeah. underclass and you've got a, you know, the dregs doing all the hard work. Okay. So he's famous. He, he affects a lot of people. Then there's two more people that come along and they're, they're all related in a way, but different. There's a guy named F.A. Hyatt, a famous economist. I kept hearing about him. I'm a political scientist. I'm a journalist. I hear this name, but I haven't taken the time to read this famous book. It turns out it's the Bible of the right. It's written, his book is called, the famous book, it's his political book, as he calls it. He's an economist, but he's also a, a, a political polem polemicist. It's called The Road to Serfdom. It's super famous on the right. Paul Ryan had all of his staff read it, you know, and <laughs> and also he, he, he liked uh, Ayn Rand, who's the other person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ted Cruz loved them both, okay? So it turns out Hayek writes a book when he's in England, when he fled the Nazis. And he's writing it for the English, but it gets picked up by the Americans. And he's saying, look, there's only two ways forward. These are minimal government, like the 19th century ideal of having, you know, basically a post office and the military and nothing else. Or if we start having more government, like the New Deal, it's going to inevitably lead to totalitarianism. Mm. It's going to lead to this dark abyss. And there's no middle path in Hayek. And he makes this a really powerful argument. He's right about central planning. He says central planning won't work. As an economist, I know, well, most economists and thinkers understand that, and they agree with him. And most American liberals, smart liberals like, like um, Arthur Schlesinger, who was one of, famous historian and one of Kennedy's uh, John Kennedy's top aides. A lot of people understand. Uh, one of my professors, Charles Lindblom, totally understand you need to have a private sector as well as government. That's Otherwise, you give way too much power to government. So no one's talking about getting rid of the private sector. But the experience of the last 70 years, whatever, Canada hasn't turned into a totalitarian nightmare nor has Germany, nor has Denmark, nor has England. The empirical evidence is against Hayek. But he still holds a vice around people or convenient vice for the right. This is the book they base their opposition to climate change on. They think that we'll have a totalitarian state. We can't have a big state. We should just do, everything has to happen with the market. So that's one. The other one is Ayn Rand. She's also a European intellectual. The key is Spencer, Hayek and Rand were all European intellectuals fearing commun fearing Marx and fearing a Marxist-Leninist situation. And it didn't apply to America. They came here and their ideas caught on, but it doesn't fit the American experience. So Rand, her family's company is taken over by the Bolsheviks when she's 12. And it's burned into her mind. And she gets out of Russia eventually. She comes to Hollywood of all places. And she's, you know, she's involved with Hollywood and she starts writing novels and she's a good novel writer. She's not high literature, but she's a good, and she writes these famous books, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. They still sell an amazing amount of copies. But she, in those books, 
the villain is, you know, the moochers. The villain is the liberal nanny state, right? She, she has one of her guys named Galt have this speech. It's like a Fidel Castro type speech where he's wailing on about, you know, the, the twist of Atlas Shrugged is it, it's like flips Marx upside down. The capitalist class leaves and nobody knows what to do. The society falls apart because the rich, brilliant 1% have left the stage. They are in hiding. And everything crumbles because nobody, all of us are incompetent, right? Right. Well, you know, so it's, it's funny, but her work is also colored by a very dark view reading of the famous German philosopher Nietzsche. And as one of my friends told me, you know, Nietzsche, reading Nietzsche is like the Bible, you know, or Shakespeare. You can have multiple interpretations <laughs> of that. <laughs> Right. And, 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 and one one famous observer of Nietzsche said, just keep reading. You'll find something that contradicts what you think he said. Right? <laughs> so it's really easy to get, you know, uh, to get to get run afoul with with that. And, but she has this crude vision of Nietzsche, which colors her vision. And again, she's a two part society. There's the, the good people and there's the moochers. So to connect. With the audience, if you think about Romney's famous speech that came out when he's in Florida during his campaign for president, and it comes out, he says the forty-seven percent, right? You know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not going to be, pre- I'm going to be president for this for the people who are the producers, right, and not for the people who are, you know, bilking the system and not being productive citizens. That's straight out of Rand. Those ideas from those three thinkers. Even though they're back in time, they still very much influence the American right, the reactionary right, which is committed to weakening the American state. I mean, look at coronavirus now. It's not only Trump is inept and you know totally out of his league, even if he wanted to try to help us, right? right. It's that the right wing has systematically tried to weaken American government for decades, and they don't believe in the federal government. They don't believe in national government. They want the states to be doing everything, right? They they hate the national government. And that's where, from before, the Wallace interpretation of, you know, right, what Wallace does is he's brilliant because he has a famous speech where he talks about segregation now, segregation forever. And so he's trying to become the leader of the the white South during the civil rights movement. But in that famous speech, he criticizes government a lot more than he criticizes blacks and his sublimation of rage at blacks into rage at government sets up Rush Limbaugh and all the other people on the right since, because it's okay to go around saying you hate government, but for a lot of people that hear that or believe it, you know, a good portion of them know that that means the government's helping the people who are cutting in line in front of me, meaning minorities cutting in front of white guys. Right. And it's not for us anymore. And so that's, you know, this, this, this um, reaction against that. Right. And, and that's how the two threads come together. But that, those, those two threads are very different places for a long time. They're coming together over the last 30, 40 years. And it got more radical once um, Gingrich took power with the speakership and once the Tea Party revolt happened. Because what's strange is Reagan, to go back to him, a famous, right, the most famous politician on the right in our modern age, he's, he's like the Republican Roosevelt, was he had a liberal family and in Illinois. He was, not, he was taught not to be racist. He famously had, like, when they went to a football game and his black, you know, teammate couldn't sleep. He said, just come to my house. And they, you know, the motel wouldn't let him sleep there. Right. But he knew how to use racism as a politician. Right. So he, he's in Hollywood. He's very skilled politically. He's, he's red high. He's more intellectual than people think. He becomes governor twice. And, you know, that's great training for the presidency. And so he's got the background that a guy like Trump doesn't have at all. So, so Reagan went through the exercise of actually doing it. He's liberal in his heart, but in his head, he's a right winger. And so he's like halfway there to becoming a reactionary. So when they said, let Reagan be Reagan, 
they were kind of hoping that he'd be all the way with him, but they, the right was frustrated that he didn't do more. But once Reagan and his lieutenant, George H. W. Bush, move on, then the party becomes more Southern centric and it, this reactionary revolution takes off and gets, gets, gets worse. And yeah. And, and to get to that point of where we're at now with reactionary illiberals and in kind of relation to what you just talked about in this more recent history, we do have a question from uh, William Yankis who uh, is asking about the convergence on how you view the convergence of, of the new conservative conservatism with the basis of with, Wallace and say some and someone like the intellectual elitism of William F. Buckley Jr. and how those mergings that came into the this kind of new conservative um new conservatism, yeah. you know. Be, be, yeah, be, because um yeah, um because because Wallace had had kind of shown the future for the Republican Party or the people that wanted to be quote conservative on race, right? Mm -hmm. The Republicans decided they, 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 there was more Republicans who voted for the Civil Rights Act than Democrats. Right. And then things flip. Um, so Wallace, you know, n anybody who heard him didn't miss his message, but he's criticizing bureaucrats as people that can't, experts, they don't know how to park their bicycle straight, you know, pointy headed intellectuals, kind of the, the language that Agnew had. And then you got William F. Buckley, who's a real intellectual, really smart guy. Well, Buckley's family was connected to the South and Buckley's magazine supported the South and segregation in the 50s. They, they were not ahead on civil rights. They were more conservative. They were like Goldwater, mm -hmm. right? Like Goldwater famously did not vote for the civil rights law. He's from Arizona. There's hardly any blacks here. He will not vote for it. He says it's a constitutional issue, right? I don't want to do that. We're going to have a police state if we do this. Right. Um, so... So the, it's like they can see that if they ally the Southern more, you know, the Southern tradition of, of Wallace types with the Buckleys who are from New York and more cultured and the, the Yankees, that they could get power inside the Republican Party and start to shove aside the people. Like think about during Watergate, but, um, Howard Baker, the famous question, you know, when did, when did Nixon know? When did he know it? People like that who right. were normal politicians, and up up through um, up through Bob Dole, normal politicians. You might not agree with them, but you knew you could you could you could uh, negotiate with them, and, right? And, and end up feeling the same. Like you still love the country. Like you don't have a different ideal. The problem with our politics is that when you have a Madisonian system that's complicated, like it is, as long as you have two parties that are fundamentally fairly close and share the same ideals right, that reject old Europe, <clears throat> it works. But if one party or the other marches to the extremes, right, and in our case, it's been the Republicans that have marched. They're not fascist yet, but they're not conservative. And I really think journalists should think twice before they put the conservative lab label on where the Republicans are now. They're reactionary or they're illiberal. The same thing could happen if the Democrats went off and became not just democratic socialists like Bernie says he wants to be, but if they became Marxist Leninists who want to overthrow capitalism and liberal democracy, right. then how, how do you negotiate with people like that? And in our case right now, look at the border situation. When they want to put people in little kids in cages, how do you negotiate about something like that about immigration? It becomes impossible. And the whole system breaks down. So Madisonian system, Madisonian democracy freezes up. And, and, you, and that's something that, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And that's something that you, that is obviously the, 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 the main, one of the main points coming, leading up to tr President Trump is, is how these new illiberal reactionary, the more accurate term for the, those who are in power and now how, how they in in their kind of like creation over the last you know in particular the last 40 50 years and the history that you give before that has 
really led to Trump. Trump was isn't isn't just he didn't just manifest, uh, you know, and just be and all of a sudden he was there. It was the groundwork was being laid for a long time. And yeah, and 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 you, and you, and you, and you talk about that. You do, I mean, talk about that a lot, obviously. Right. And, and so one way to think about this is like McConnell. Right. The, right. The Republican politicians. It's the political class on the on the on the on the, on the right. There's millions of conservatives in the country who have been abandoned, and some of them don't follow politics. They, they kind of know, they want to believe that the Republican Party of Reagan's still there, and they like less taxes and less regulation, you know, some of the business class. But they have to realize the whole party at the leadership level has shifted over. And so McConnell's, you know, people were given choices, right? And some people said, I'm not going to go there. Basically, McCain, though he, he went to the right a little bit to get reelected, but he mm-hmm. wanted to stay true. Right. Um, McConnell, on the other hand, seems to be a person who is a Southerner from Kentucky, and he wanted the power he's got in the Senate. And he'll use any and and he's been reactionary in the sense that how are reactionary is different conservatives, that they're willing to break norms that are central to how the system works with impunity if they can keep power. So when he did not allow Obama to have a vote on his Supreme Court nominee. Mm. That was violating the Constitution because it doesn't matter that it's in the last year of the president's time. He has a right to have, and it was just an in-your-face thing because McConnell could have rigged the vote. He just wouldn't allow hearings. It was just an outright, you know, (laughs) we're taking power and forget it, dudes. And. And Juan Lentz, who was a famous political scientist, uh, one of the guys I was fortunate to study with at Yale, um, he's an expert on Europe and Latin America and the breakdown of democracy. He said, once the norms get broken and people think that if they lose the election, everything's at risk, right? You want a system where if you lose, oh, we'll get up and we'll work and we can win next time. It's not going to be so bad. But when both sides, because of how far they're apart, feel like my side must win, right? And this time yeah. the liberals feel that way with Trump because they think, good grief, where's the country going to be when he gets real, if he gets reelected? Right. right. He has no respect for the Constitution. He's, he's going, he's on an authoritarian, he's, he's on the authoritarian track, right? Yeah. And, and, and then both parties get desperate, right? And then, and then you get, you can get a situation where things can spin out of control. And, President Obama was talking about that last week when he said in this speech he gave, things can accelerate fast. He was talking about the Justice Department under Barr, dismissing a case where Barr had, where Flynn had admitted lying twice, and it was just the sentencing that was left. And for the, and Trump could have just pardoned Flynn, but they wanted to do an in-your-face to try to undermine the Department of Justice and the FBI. And and it's just, you know, they're just eroding everything that you need. It's not just elections that make a democracy. It's a whole package. Right. And it's a a whole package. And it's you view it as as, as this kind of crisis point for the republic in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, And a final thing, because I know we're getting uh, late on time. I want to get to, I have a chapter at the end of the book where everything kind of came together. I, I, you know, I had the book written, I thought several times, then I kept working on it. And then I came up with this idea, we're actually in a reactionary revolution that in most countries, you have a revolution that's like 10 or 15 years and you get a bit of a reaction against it. And then the revolution's over, right? Uh, in the French revolution, it gets really violent. Robespierre ends up getting, getting killed and then the revolution stops. In the American Revolution, we never go from the moderate phase to the radical, right. and we stay moderate. We stay kind of locking. We're not we're not utopians, and and the the revolution becomes violent with the Civil War, mm-hmm. and then after Lincoln, the presidents on the good side, so to speak, on the liberal side, they focus on inclusion, and we bring in women, right. The, the, the suffragettes were able to get Woodrow Wilson, who was a segregationist, to say yes to women's rights. And then we get the whole thing with the civil rights movement, and now we have with gays, right? So we've included everybody into the thing. Mm-hmm. 
So, so that's on the liberal side. So we don't have Lincoln or FDR. Nobody was a radical where they were taking people out and putting them in jail, or right. let alone killing them. Right. And so our revolution is different. But on the on the reactionary side, we're having a reactionary counter revolution, much delayed. Mm-hmm. Right. The two pieces have finally come together, and said, "Wait, you know, we're going to challenge not only the New Deal but the found." And if they win, if Trump wins or his successor wins. We can have a much different country. And the, right. the piece of the puzzle that comes into this is when you look, most of my book, 90% of my books about America, American mm-hmm. history, right? It's a, re, it's a reading of American history. But if, if you know something about Latin America and Europe, having the, the fate of the landed elite was like a key, according to scholar Barrington Moore, so whether a country would become a democracy or become a, be vulnerable to a dictatorship. And what happened to the landed elite? Were they defeated? Were they eliminated? Were, did they marry? Did they just kind of change their tune over time? In France, they got eliminated with the revolution. In mm-hmm. England, they married into the gentry. So by Churchill's time, Churchill's with democracy, very much so. And there's just a few that would collaborate with the Nazis of the land of the big, the rich aristocratic families. Right. In Germany, it wasn't the case. In Germany, the Junkers, who were the landed Prussian landowners in, in Eastern Germany, they never lost power. And they hated the Weimar Republic. And they helped mm-hmm. undermine it, And they helped set up Hitler. So Barrington Moore's point is, in Latin America, you had you know the 10 families in a country that would run politics and everybody's poor. And you have the the labor organizers and the reformers in the cities, but they can't get past an alliance of capital and the landed elite. In America's case, we've got the ideological descendants of the slave owners. Right? The slave owners are gone. We know that they're dead and buried a long time ago. But because of that 100 years between 1865 and right. 1965, that stuff is just cooking. And yeah. then Wallace keeps it going, and now Trump's kept it going. And people, they don't want to say they're racist, right? This is an interesting right. thing. I just read Joy Reid has a very nice book um, about Trump. Um, and it's the kind of thing where people will say, well, I'm not racist. But they'll say they're going to go ahead and vote for somebody that's got clearly discriminatory policies or, in Trump's case, is in your face. Yeah. Right? Right. Um, and and so we so those two things have come together the the ideological descendants of the, of our landed elite are now mm-hmm. in cahoots in the Republican Party. They they control one political party. That's what's different. Right. They control one of the two political parties. And the, I think one of the keys for us in this election and going forward is do some people that are normal conservative business people come to realize it's not just Trump's a clown and, you know, crazy and chaotic and stuff like that. He's an unusual president, granted. But that they understand that the Republican Party is now dangerous. Right. Right. And you have these conservative intellectuals. Um, a number of them basically say the current Republican Party should be burned to the ground. Mm-hmm. This is not where they, they've abandoned the ship. Right. A, a number of, you know, but that, that's just a small intellectual group. It has to be more than that, right? Either we yeah. get a very persuasive Democratic candidate who can peel off some of the white working class that's gone with Trump, right? Or we get some of the business class peeling off. But if, you know, you got to get some movement right. to get to break out of this red blue divide because it's not just, it's like Ezra Klein has a very good book called We Are Why We Are Polarized. Mm-hmm. It's very good about the polarization, the dynamics of it and everything. He goes through that in a lot of studies. But he doesn't talk about the ideological content of the polarization. You could be polarized and it wouldn't make much difference. Right? Mm-hmm. You could have, right? If, but, if, but if one of the parties is polarized and, and their ideology is toxic to the founding ideals of the country, then you got real trouble. And that's where we are. And you need, we need more people to understand that's what's going on. It's not just the Trump circus, you know, there's distractions and stuff like that. It's, you know, that, that not enough. You would have expected 
more Republicans with a conscience that were still conservatives to have stood up and said, no, you can't do that. But they rarely speak up. Like Romney was patted on the back when he's the one guy to vote on the impeachment. But there's a lot of cases since then, you know, normal bills and stuff where you'd expect, aren't some people going to break? No, no, they're with the cult. Yeah. Right. They're, they're trying to protect their political life. They think they think they can get through this and that we'll be senators longer than he's president. If if they're good people, maybe they're with him all the way. Right. But secretly, the reporters say usually they, they're critical, you know, off the record, but, but they don't on. act. But yeah. not on it. And that's yeah. that's. That's a dangerous place for the country, and 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 um, you know I followed politics a long time, and I just decided I wanted to write this book where I took a side, because it just like was important. It's like this is not normal. <laughs> this is right. dangerous, right? And I wanted right. to be, and other people are doing the same thing. This is dangerous, and I think I've got a, a logic to why it is dangerous. You know, I've, I've yeah. Related. And I think that's what people can really discover by by reading it. We had we had one other question that you kind of basically basically covered, which was the entirety of this conversation, which is why you chose sorrow when you say Madison's sorrow. And it's I mean yeah. we've talked about Madisonian democracy this whole time and how we're right. this is it's it's really just this book is just tracking the history of of how we got to this point and why it's in danger. Now. Right. So it's, I would think two ways, right? Madison and the founders, if they could look down from heaven, you know, they would be sad with what's going on. Right. You know, a guy that's just trashing the Constitution and his parties along with him. And then secondly, what just what you said, that they worked hard to come up with a, with a system that was complicated. You know, they give it's federalist. So you give a lot of power to the states. It's got divided government. It's all these things. Right. And, and it's worked really well for 200 years, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it you need, um, it, it can't put up with everything. Right. right. It can't, it can't put up with everything. It, it's an, it, it will fracture. It will, it, it will freeze up, you know, and, and we'll be in a, we'll be in a worse place than we are now, which is, we're not in a good place right now. That's for right. sure. You know, I when, mean, who knows about the election if they're, if, if they're going to, they won't let them, vote by mail, you know, is there going to be right. contests about voting? You've got, you know, the, the, and all this stuff about not allowing voting, that's back to the reconstruction, the original mm -hmm. reconstruction and stuff that, that, uh, that the Southern states did to defeat reconstruction the first time was to suppress vote. So it's got a lot, that's got a long history and that's, that's not part of American democracy that we're proud of for sure. Right. And I think, uh, I think people can, can really be able to, to get into even more. So obviously the, the meat of all of that um, by, uh, by picking up this book um, uh, because uh, it's, it's, it's really important. And, uh, and Kevin, I, I really appreciate you uh, being here with us tonight. Uh, and, uh, and, and I hope everybody um, enjoyed what we did. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll remind the listeners that the book's not overly long. <laughs> it's only, I'm very happy that it, when you never know, even though I'd seen the page proofs and PDF, it's like, oh, good, it's only 240 pages in text. And that's with 16 pages of pictures. So, right. you know, it's, it's not it's not like that, which a lot of these books, history books are. Yeah. So it's, it's compact. Yes. Right? So it's, we... Yeah, it's and it, so we encourage everybody to go ahead and you can, like I said, you right. can go down there uh, where it says "Buy Madison Sorrow." Click on there. You, can, you. can get through the, uh, the Romans website, order it there, uh, and uh, get it delivered to you if you'd like. Um, okay, so, thank you thanks everyone. Thank you everyone for for tuning in uh, for supporting independent bookstores. Um, uh, please make sure to uh, give us a follow uh, on uh, our social media, or you can always subscribe to our newsletter uh, where you'll get. Um, your emails about uh, events like this and uh, you can follow us here on crowdcast so again thanks so much kevin have a wonderful night uh, everybody all thank right. you so thanks, much Gilbert. Really all appreciate right it so much bye -bye. take care bye bye good night everyone